What was it like to live in the Wild West? Experience the wild side of the untamed frontier as we uncover 25 strange and shocking tales from the Wild West like you've never heard before. What was it like to live in the Wild West? Living in the Wild West during the mid-19th century was like navigating a landscape caught in the throes of transformation. By 1865, a vast network of over 30,000 miles of train tracks crisscrossed the U.S., connecting the East and West Coasts. With the Civil War finally over and many unshackled from slavery, millions of Americans were drawn to the untamed West in pursuit of new homes and new riches. The concept of manifest destiny fueled this westward migration, with one 19th century historian famously describing the new frontier as, quote, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. This description was not an exaggeration. The era witnessed the decimation of scores of buffalo, not only for their hides, but also as a tactic to starve Native Americans who depended on the bison for sustenance. As settlers streamed into the West, new towns sprang up along cattle routes, often driven by the booming cattle industry. However, these burgeoning communities weren't immune to lawlessness. Ruthless cowboys, seeking thrills or profit, sometimes terrorized these towns, leading the local residents to establish their own rules of law and order. This period in American history was truly unlike any other. Number 25. Millions of bison were slaughtered. In the vast expanses of the Wild West, a shocking chapter unfolded that forever altered the landscape of North America. At the beginning of the 19th century, estimates suggest that between 10 and 30 million bison, often referred to as American buffalo, roamed freely across the plains. However, by the early 1900s, this majestic species was pushed to the brink of extinction, with less than a thousand remaining. So what led to the catastrophic decline of these iconic creatures? The answer lies in the ruthless slaughter orchestrated primarily by the U.S. Army or by those commissioned by it. The buffalo held immense significance for Native American communities, serving as a vital source of both sustenance and materials. Recognizing this, the U.S. government initiated a deliberate campaign to eliminate the buffalo, beginning as early as 1830. One chilling quote from a colonel during a hunting expedition encapsulates the government's approach. Quote, Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. Even the famed Buffalo Bill Cody himself is attributed to having killed a staggering 4,000 bison in just two years. By 1889, the bison population had plummeted to its lowest point, with a mere 256 buffalo held in captivity. Fortunately, conservation efforts have since led to a resurgence in their numbers with today's bison population ranging from 150 to 200,000. If you're eager to catch a glimpse of these magnificent creatures, one of the best places to do so is Yellowstone National Park. Number 24. Dead outlaws were propped up and photographed. The Old West was a place where legends, both heroic and infamous, were born. When notorious outlaws met their fateful end, it was a spectacle that townsfolk couldn't resist. Newspapers throughout the country eagerly chronicled their exploits, often embellishing them in contemporary books. But it didn't end there. When these outlaws met their demise, whether in a blazing gunfight or via the hangman's noose, townspeople sought proof and authorities aimed to send a clear message to potential wrongdoers. Enter the invention of photography during the first quarter of the 19th century. Suddenly, there was a new and macabre way to achieve both objectives. The lifeless bodies of these dead outlaws would be carefully propped up, sometimes entire gangs pushed together for a gruesome group photo, while other times it was a macabre duo standing side by side. These eerie photos served as a haunting memento of their final moments before being consigned to a six-foot-deep grave. Number 23 cowboys didn't wear 10-gallon hats. When you think of the cowboys of the Wild West, you might picture them sporting those oversized headpieces famously known as 10-gallon hats. But here's a surprising fact. 
Those iconic cowboy hats we often associate with the Old West were not the norm during that era. In fact, the trend of the 10-gallon hat only emerged in the 1920s, largely thanks to Hollywood's portrayal of cowboys. So what kind of headgear did real cowboys, ranchers, farmers, and people of various professions wear back then? Their hat of choice was the flat-rimmed Stetson, aptly named the Boss of the Plains. John Stetson, founder of the Stetson Hat Company, recognized the need for practical headwear in the unforgiving plains of the West. Traditional hats made of materials like straw, silk, fur, and wool posed problems. They were too hot during scorching summers and soaked up rain during the wetter seasons. In contrast, the Boss of the Plains was designed to be lightweight, waterproof, and durable. Its insulating interior could even double as a makeshift bucket for a horse, while the wide brim provided essential protection from the sun. These hats, made with Nutria fur, were available at a retail price of $4.50, which, adjusted for inflation, would today be roughly $74. Number 22. Many brands from the Old West are still around. Imagine being transported back in time to the Old West, stepping into a bustling general store, and coming across some familiar brands that have remarkably stood the test of time. Even in that rugged era, some household names we recognize today were already making their mark. Among them, Quaker Oats, Royal Baking Powder, Baker's Chocolate, Durkee, Arm & Hammer, Fleischmann's Yeast, and Pillsbury Flour. These iconic brands remind us that while times and tastes change, some things from the Old West still have a place in our modern lives. Number 21. America's first serial killer family emerged. The Wild West conjures images of gunslingers and outlaws, but it also harbored its share of real-life horrors. Meet the Bender family, notoriously known as the Bloody Benders, who emerged as America's first serial killer family. In a quaint town in Labette County, Kansas, during a one-year span from 1871 to 1872, the Benders operated a seemingly ordinary family cabin. Behind this facade, however, lay a sinister truth. Their cabin doubled as a general store and a small lodging home for travelers passing through the area. What made the Benders truly unsettling were their peculiar and unfriendly demeanor. The family consisted of John Bender Sr. and his wife Elvira, along with their son John Jr. and his girlfriend Kate, who some suspect may have been John Jr.'s sister. Disturbingly, the Benders are believed to have lured and killed at least 11 unsuspecting travelers. The victims' remains were secretly buried in the family orchard. As suspicions grew and the disappearances began to raise alarms, the bloody benders realized that the law was closing in. They vanished without a trace. Number 20. Elmer McCurdy's corpse had more fun than he did. Elmer McCurdy, at just 31 years old, met his demise in a hail of bullets, shot dead by police after a failed train robbery in Oklahoma in 1911. That marked the end of a string of botched heists that characterized McCurdy's short and ill-fated life. His final criminal blunder? He and his gang robbed a passenger train, expecting to find a fortune, only to escape with a mere $46, mistaking it for a much more lucrative Katy train. However, what happened to McCurdy after his death is a story stranger than fiction. The sheriff, seeking to profit from the outlaw's demise, sold his body to a carnival owner. This carnival proprietor mummified McCurdy's corpse, launching it into a bizarre afterlife. In the 20s and 30s, it wasn't uncommon for carnivals to feature such macabre displays. Elmer McCurdy became an attraction, first as the outlaw who would never be captured alive, and later as an example of a supposed dope fiend. Over time, McCurdy's identity faded and people assumed he was a mere prop. He traveled across carnivals and wax museums, eventually landing in a California amusement park where he became part of a funhouse exhibit. In a bizarre twist, the $6 million man production crew stumbled upon McCurdy's body in 1976. They moved it, and to everyone's astonishment, McCurdy's arm popped off, 
revealing the macabre truth beneath the wax and paint. Finally, in 1977, 66 years after his death, Elmer McCurdy was returned to Guthrie, Oklahoma for a proper burial. For those intrigued by the eerie world of old carnivals and sideshows, a visit to the International Independent Showmen's Museum in Riverview, Florida promises even more chilling tales. Number 19. The First Quick Draw Gunfight Wild Bill Hickok vs. Davis Tut It all went down in Springfield, Missouri between the legendary gunslinger Wild Bill Hickok and a man named Davis Tut. The genesis of this deadly encounter lay in a simmering dispute over gambling winnings. Tut had financially backed other gamblers in an attempt to outwit and bankrupt Hickok, aiming to drive him out of town. But fortune favored Hickok, and as a result, Tut demanded $40 from him, citing a previous deal involving a horse. According to Tom Clavin's book, Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontier's first gunfighter, Hickok was initially reluctant, but finally handed over the $40. However, Tut's greed knew no bounds, and he pressed for an additional $25. When Hickok refused, Tut impulsively seized Hickok's pocket watch from the table. The situation escalated dramatically. The next morning, in Springfield's town square on July 21, 1865, Tut flaunted the stolen watch. Despite Hickok's attempts to reason with him, Tut remained defiant. As the clock neared 6 p.m., Hickok issued a stern warning to Tut not to cross the square with that watch. Ignoring the warning, Tut made a move for his gun, and in a heartbeat, Hickok responded in kind. The two men locked eyes, paused, and then lightning fast, they drew their pistols. The confrontation culminated with Hickok's bullet piercing Tut's heart. This dramatic showdown marked the first quick-draw fight ever recorded and word of it spread like wildfire. Two years later, Harper's new monthly magazine featured an illustration depicting the event. Number 18. The First Moving Train Robbery – The Reno Gang Heist Picture this, it's October 6, 1866 in Indiana. A seemingly ordinary day until it etched its name into the history books as the site of the first ever moving train robbery. The perpetrators? The infamous Reno Gang. What followed was a heist of epic proportions. The gang brazenly boarded the train, their intentions clear as day. Their target? The safe, securely guarded by a messenger who held the keys to its treasure trove. With relentless pressure, they compelled the messenger to unlock one of the safes, revealing a staggering $18,000 in cash alongside a glittering array of jewelry and assorted valuables, all of which they promptly pocketed. But there was a catch. The larger safe, likely holding even more riches, refused to yield its secrets. In a desperate bid, the Reno gang resorted to brute force, attempting to kick the safe off the moving train, perhaps hoping to retrieve it during their escape. However, the safe proved too unwieldy, and they were forced to abandon it by the tracks. Fast forward two years to 1868, and the story takes a dark turn. Six members of the Reno gang met a gruesome end, lynched and hanged from a tree. Today, this haunting site bears the ominous marker, Hangman Crossing, and the gang members found their final resting place in Seymour, Indiana. Their graves, though accessible, lie behind a modest gate. Number 17. You could see famous gunmen perform for shows. Can you imagine strolling into a New York City theater, eager to witness legendary figures like Buffalo Bill Cody and Wild Bill Hickok spin mesmerizing tales around a campfire? Believe it or not, that was a reality. Buffalo Bill Cody, ever the visionary, conceived Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, a traveling extravaganza that showcased a diverse cast of characters. However, the show's crowning jewel was none other than the iconic gunslinger Wild Bill Hickok himself. But this wasn't your ordinary stage play. Audiences reveled in staged buffalo hunts and thrilling recreations of notorious events, such as daring stagecoach robberies. 
In 1902, Cody even orchestrated a grand parade, memorable for all time. Remarkably, footage of this fascinating event still exists, preserved in the hallowed halls of the Library of Congress. For those seeking a tangible connection to Buffalo Bill's legacy, a visit to the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave in Golden, Colorado is an absolute must. Number 16. The stage plays were poorly done. The allure of fancy gunplay and dramatic reenactments may have drawn crowds, but Buffalo Bill Cody's indoor stage plays were, to put it bluntly, gloriously awful. In fact, it was so delightfully terrible that it became the stuff of legend, akin to a so-bad-it's-good movie night. The truth is, Cody and his troupe were no Thestrians, and their writer wasn't exactly Shakespeare. These performances involved Cody, along with figures like Hickok, gathering around a simulated campfire, regaling the audience with stories and jokes. The acting was so cringeworthy that laughter echoed through the theater, but for all the wrong reasons. In one unforgettable incident, Hickok, perhaps fueled by anger, alcohol, or both, seized his pistol during a performance and promptly shot out a stage light, leaving the audience in stunned amusement. Number 15. Gun control was stricter back then. When you conjure up images of the Wild West, it's easy to picture a scene where every patron in a dusty saloon has a six-shooter strapped to their hip and an 1873 Winchester rifle stashed under their hotel room pillow. But the surprising reality is that in nascent frontier towns, such a scenario was far from the truth. Towns like Deadwood, Dodge City, Abilene, and Tombstone actually had strict laws against carrying firearms within town limits. Instead of entering the saloon with guns blazing, folks had to follow the rules. They checked their firearms with the local sheriff, receiving a token as a sort of receipt. Think of it like a coat check, but for guns. Of course, exceptions were made for residents who could rightfully keep firearms within the confines of their own homes. Number 14. The first armed bank robbery occurred in Massachusetts. When you think of bank robberies, your mind might drift to the dusty streets of the Old West. But the very first bank heist didn't unfold in that iconic setting. In fact, it happened way back in 1831, a good 30 years before the Wild West era, and it didn't involve guns at all. It was pulled off with forged keys. The first true guns blazing bank robbery unrelated to wartime events took place in 1863 in Malden, Massachusetts. The deadly incident occurred at the stroke of noon when Edward Green, the 32-year-old postmaster of the town, strolled into the Malden Bank with the intent of obtaining some change. Green, drowning in debt and known for his heavy drinking, saw an opportunity when he entered the bank on December 15th. At that time, only a 17-year-old boy, the son of the bank's president, was on duty. Green left the bank, returned home to fetch his firearm, and brutally shot the young boy in the head. He then calmly walked back into the bank and made off with $5,000 in cash, a sum equivalent to over $105,000 today. However, Green's sudden financial turnaround raised eyebrows in the community. People began to question how a man previously mired in debt could suddenly settle his accounts. Reportedly, Green confessed to the murder just a month later and met his fate on the gallows in 1866. This grim chapter in history also marks him as the first person to be hanged in America for committing an armed bank robbery. Number 13. Want to dine like you're in the Old West? No, you probably don't. If you're imagining dining in the Old West, you might want to rethink that culinary adventure. Food in the Wild West was far from a gourmet experience. Although there were a few exceptions, like a hearty breakfast featuring cornbread, stew, boiled eggs, fried potatoes, and omelets, the overall food scene was less than appealing. For dinner, you might have encountered dishes like a calf's head, boiled mutton, or soused calf's feet on your plate. As for dessert, you could hope for pudding. Those were the typical frontier family's meal options back in 1853. Cooking methods were straightforward, involving ovens, frying pans, and roasting spits. 
Plus, the menu was heavily dependent on whatever meat or vegetables were in season at the time. Cowboys, in particular, had their own culinary struggles, surviving on canned beans, rock-hard biscuits, dried meat, dried fruit, and coffee. If you're intrigued by history but prefer modern, palatable cuisine, you might want to explore the Buckhorn Saloon and Museum in San Antonio, Texas. Number 12. The Whiskey Was Terrible You swagger into a dusty saloon, take a seat at the bar, and confidently order the bartender's finest whiskey. You raise the glass to your lips, take a sip, and then promptly sputter and choke. That so-called whiskey tastes more like industrial fuel than a fine spirit. Yet the label boasts a 10-year aging process from Kentucky. What's the deal? Well, in the Wild West, laws concerning whiskey production and copyright were as wild as the frontier itself. Lax, if they were even enforceable. And in a place where rule breakers outnumbered rule enforcers, there was little oversight. In fact, much of the whiskey sold at that time might have been adulterated with water or other spirits to maximize profits. According to Sirius Eats, some of these so-called bourbons were even distilled from low-grade molasses. The nicknames for popular whiskey during this era say it all. Coffin Varnish, Mountain Howitzer, and Tangle Leg. That last one aptly describes booze so potent that your legs might indeed get tangled when you're trying to leave the bar. Number 11. Cowboy Meant Criminal In the Old West, particularly around places like Arizona, the term cowboy had a rather sinister connotation. It often referred to outlaws and criminals. In 1881, the San Francisco Examiner even went so far as to publish an editorial stating, quote, Cowboys are the most reckless class of outlaws in that wild country, infinitely worse than the ordinary robber. What's more, there was an infamous gang known simply as the Cowboys, and they were regulars in the town of Tombstone. This group of lawless individuals was notorious for their criminal exploits, making them a source of fear and fascination in the Wild West. In the photo above, you can see the Wild Bunch, the notorious gang led by the infamous Butch Cassidy. From top left, the members are Kid Curry, Bill McCarty, Bill Todd Carver, Ben Kilpatrick, and Tom O'Day. Number 10. The famous OK Corral shootout wasn't much of a shootout. When we think of the Wild West, the OK Corral shootout in Tombstone, Arizona often comes to mind as one of its most iconic events. However, despite its legendary status, the actual gunfight was over in the blink of an eye, lasting just about 30 seconds. On one side of the law, there were the Earp brothers, Wyatt, Morgan, and Virgil, accompanied by Doc Holliday. Facing off against them were members and associates of the cowboy gang, including Ike and Billy Clanton, Tom and Frank McClory, and Billy Claiborne. Surprisingly, only three of these men were armed. It remains a mystery who fired first, but what's known is that those 30 seconds saw 30 bullets fly. Virgil Earp shot Clanton in the chest. Doc Holliday used a shotgun to take down Tom McClory, and Wyatt Earp's shot struck Frank McClory in the gut. Clanton and Claiborne, the remaining cowboys, fled the scene, unharmed and without their weapons. Following the shootout, the Earps and Holliday were brought to trial for murder. Testimony was divided, with some sympathizing with the cowboys and blaming the Earps and Holliday while others supported the lawmen. Ultimately, a judge ruled in favor of the Earps and Holiday, leading to their acquittal. Today, you can witness a reenactment of this famous shootout in modern-day Tombstone, which takes place three times daily. For those interested in delving deeper into Wyatt Earps' history, you can also visit his boyhood home in Pella, Iowa. Number 9. Camels in Texas? Yep. Believe it or not, there was a time when you might have encountered a wild camel while traversing the Texas Plains. In 1855, the U.S. government allocated a whopping $30,000 to purchase and import these desert-dwelling creatures. At the time, Jefferson Davis, who would later become the Secretary of War of the Confederacy, believed that camels could play a pivotal role in transporting goods across the vast western territories. 
The idea had merit, since the Transcontinental Railroad was still far from completion in 1855. Consequently, the U.S. government imported 75 camels and stationed them at Camp Verde in central Texas. The camels were employed in supply trips to San Antonio, proving their worth in the arid terrain. However, an unexpected adversary emerged, the Mule Lobby, often referred to as Big Mule. They lobbied vigorously against the integration of these humpbacked creatures into the Army's operations. When the Civil War erupted, it marked the end of the camel experiment. After Texas seceded from the Union, the Confederate Army took control of Camp Verde, effectively releasing the camels into the wild. Number 8. Black Bart Robbed with Style Throughout Wild West history, amidst the notorious outlaws and murderous desperados, one figure stands out as an intriguing anomaly, Charles Bowles, better known as Black Bart. Bowles carved his niche as a remarkably successful stagecoach robber, specializing in heists that possessed an air of refinement, if you can imagine such a thing. Between 1875 and 1883, Black Bart boldly robbed a staggering 28 stagecoaches, all of which happened to be owned by Wells Fargo. His modus operandi was as distinctive as his choice of targets. Picture this. He'd don a flour sack, cleverly punctuated with eye holes, top it off with a black derby hat, and brandish a firearm with style. Approaching his victims in the middle of a desolate road, he'd command the stagecoach driver to relinquish their precious lockbox. On one daring occasion, when a stage driver contemplated resistance, Black Bart orchestrated a ruse. Hidden accomplices hiding in the bushes pointed barrels menacingly at the stagecoach. The intimidated driver wisely surrendered the box, allowing Black Bart to vanish into the wilderness with his ill-gotten gains. However, what truly set Black Bart apart were his poetic inclinations. Leaving behind verses for law enforcement to ponder, his most infamous creation goes like this. I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor, and for riches. But on my corns too long you've tread, you fine-haired sons of... Eventually, the long arm of the law caught up with Black Bart. He served six years in prison, only to mysteriously disappear. Number 7. Poker Alice Made Her Fortune Playing Cards In the male-dominated world of gambling in the Wild West, women had their place if the establishment allowed it. One remarkable woman who left her mark on the card tables was Alice Ivers Tubbs, better known as Poker Alice. Alice, originally an English immigrant, embarked on her journey to becoming a formidable poker player under the tutelage of her first husband. She honed her skills at various saloons, ultimately mastering the art of poker. What set her apart wasn't just her card prowess. It was her refined demeanor, striking beauty, penchant for cigar smoking, and the ever-present 38 revolver she carried for protection. Alice's reputation for handling herself didn't just extend to the poker table. On one occasion, she shot a miner in the arm after he threatened her future husband, making it abundantly clear that she was no pushover. Born in 1851, Alice's adventures didn't stop at the card tables. During Prohibition, she boldly opened her own saloon. When a rampaging soldier threatened to destroy her establishment, Alice defended her turf and shot him dead. Her claim of having won $250,000 through gambling speaks volumes about her skill. Alice's colorful life came to an end at the age of 79 in Rapid City, South Dakota. For those looking to delve into the legend of Poker Alice, there are modern biographies that chronicle her captivating story. Alternatively, you can experience a slice of her history by staying at Poker Alice's house, available on Airbnb in Sturgis, South Dakota. Number 6. Calamity Jane was buried next to Wild Bill Hickok, possibly as a joke. Calamity Jane, an enigmatic figure of the Old West, was known for weaving a tapestry of tall tales about herself. Among her claims, one disputed aspect of her life involved skirmishes with Native Americans. While the veracity of many of her stories remains uncertain, her connection with Wild Bill Hickok is a well-documented chapter of her life. Jane's path crossed with Hickox on a wagon train en route to Deadwood, and there they formed an acquaintance. 
Whether Hickok harbored genuine affection for Jane is a matter of debate. Some accounts paint a less flattering picture, suggesting that while Bill had, quote, absolutely no use for Jane, and decided, quite unusually, to have her buried beside him as a practical joke. Another perspective posits that it might have been Jane's own dying wish to rest eternally next to Hickok. Alternatively, local business owners could have orchestrated the unconventional burial, recognizing the marketing potential of such an arrangement to draw curious visitors and boost commerce. In the end, regardless of the motivation, Calamity Jane found her final resting place next to Wild Bill Hickok in Mount Moriah Cemetery in Deadwood. Number 5. Mining towns were more expensive than living in Silicon Valley is today. The California Gold Rush triggered a frenzied rush to the hills, giving rise to mining camps and towns that sprouted like wildfire. This explosive growth in population and demand for goods had an unforeseen consequence, skyrocketing prices that bordered on outrageously high. Astonishingly, it was more expensive to reside in some of these mining towns during the Gold Rush era than it is to live in Silicon Valley today. Take a look at the staggering prices that characterized life in Californian mining towns in 1851. A single egg could set you back as much as $3, which translates to a staggering $105 today. A pound of butter was priced at a jaw-dropping $20, equivalent to about $700 today. Gold pans, which previously sold for a mere 20 cents just two years earlier, now commanded a princely sum of $8, roughly $280 by today's standards. Shovels, essential tools for prospectors, came with a staggering price tag of $36, amounting to an astonishing $1,259 in today's money. It's important to note that despite these exorbitant prices, most miners could only hope to find $10 to $15 worth of gold each day. Number 4. Dodge City was extremely violent. While Hollywood may have sensationalized the violence of the Wild West, it's important to dispel the myth that it was a lawless paradise. One town that truly lived up to its reputation for violence, however, was Dodge City, Kansas. Dodge City gained notoriety for its extreme levels of violence, making it the most infamous and dangerous town in the region. During its heyday, Dodge City had an annual recorded murder rate of 165 murders per 100,000 people. To put that in perspective, if you lived in Dodge City from 1876 to 1885, you had a 1 in 61 chance of falling victim to murder. Comparatively, in 2020, the most violent city in the world, Celaya, Mexico, had a murder rate of 138 people killed per 100,000 people. Number 3. This is why it's called Dead Man's Hand. In the world of poker, the term Dead Man's Hand refers to a specific hand consisting of two aces and two eights. But have you ever wondered why it's called that? Well, it all goes back to one fateful day in the town of Deadwood. Wild Bill Hickok, a legendary figure in the Wild West, was known for his exceptional poker skills. However, his luck took a tragic turn one day when he was holding two black-suited pairs, the Ace of Spades and the Ace of Clubs, along with the Eight of Spades and the Eight of Clubs. It was this ill-fated hand he held when Jack McCall shot him in the back of the head. Legend has it that these cards, the Black Aces and Eights, became known as Dead Man's Hand in honor of Wild Bill Hickok. McCall was swiftly brought to justice and hanged for his heinous crime and the trial received widespread attention. Today, you can still witness a chilling piece of history at Saloon No. 10 in modern-day Deadwood, the very chair in which Wild Bill Hickok met his tragic end. Number 2. Women were welcome in saloons. In the 1800s, social norms and values were quite different from what we know today, especially when it came to women in bars. East of the Missouri River, it was extremely uncommon to find women drinking alongside men. However, when you ventured further west, away from the influence of Puritan values, you'd discover a different scene, a place where women were not only present but welcome in saloons. Among these women were a diverse group. Some were prostitutes, often referred to as painted ladies, who frequented dingy bars in search of patrons. 
Others were dance hall women, entertainers, and hostesses who added a touch of glamour to these establishments. They would sing, dance, and engage in conversation with male patrons, all the while encouraging them to order another round of drinks. According to Legends of America, saloon girls could earn a weekly wage of $10. On top of that, they received a commission from the drinks they sold, making it a profitable profession. Number 1. The deadliest outlaw was John Wesley Harden. In the annals of the Wild West, one name stands out as the deadliest outlaw, John Wesley Harden. Hailing from Bonham, Texas, Harden embarked on a life of violence and gunfighting at a remarkably young age. His criminal journey began when he was just 14, when he viciously stabbed a fellow student, leaving him near death. At 15, he coldly gunned down his uncle's slave and went on to kill the three soldiers who pursued him. Hardin's autobiography claims that he ended the lives of 44 men, but his book is riddled with tall tales and unverifiable accounts. While it's expected that such a character would exaggerate, what's astonishing is that he is believed to have killed at least half that number, possibly up to 30 men. His biography paints a picture of a man going from one murder to the next, a narrative that isn't far from the truth. During his time in Abilene, Kansas, he crossed paths with none other than Wild Bill Hickok, who was serving as marshal at the time. For reasons unknown, the two seemed to get along. Either Hickok was unaware of Hardin's murder warrants in Texas, or he simply didn't care. However, their camaraderie came to a halt when, in a drunken stupor on August 6, 1871, Hardin fired his gun into the neighboring hotel room due to a relentless snoring of a fellow guest. The man took his last breath as the bullet pierced his heart. People would later jest that Hardin was, quote, so mean he once shot a man for snoring too loud. Hardin managed to evade capture until 1875, when he was tried and convicted for the murder of a popular sheriff in Comanche, Texas at the age of 21. He was sentenced to 25 years, but served only 17 before a pardon led to his release in 1894. A year later, his violent life came to an end, when a heated argument escalated into his assassination. A man he had quarreled with earlier that day shot him in the back of the head while Hardin was engrossed in a game of dice. To ensure the job was done, a few more shots were fired. Today, you can catch a glimpse of John Wesley Hardin's legacy through personal artifacts displayed at the Comanche County Museum. Thank you for watching. If you've got more questions about history or want to share your own stories, drop them in the comments below. And remember, while the Old West may be gone, its legends live on. Stay tuned.